let me first of all say that my um, uh, position here, I'm, first of all, I'm just a regular faculty member at the Ohio State University. As uh, Dr. Vincent said, I hold a joint uh, professorship in the School of Music uh, and the Department of African American and African Studies. I'm a composer. Um, I'm an arranger. I write music, and I write about uh, music. I'm one of eight faculty who serve on the Athletic Council um, at Ohio State. The Athletic Council um, is the structure provided by the University Senate that is directly responsible for all academic policy matters dealing with intercollegiate athletics. Anything having to do uh, with policy matters we're concerned about. We don't hire coaches. We certainly don't fire them. Uh, we don't decide their salaries. Uh, we deal more with uh, the infrastructure of what really makes that big, huge machine go. At Ohio State, uh, we are told that uh, we may be the largest intercollegiate athletic department in the country. I think we have 36 uh, varsity sports. Um, it's a huge, huge department. Uh, the budget figure is off the charts. Um, I'm now off the committee, uh, off the council rather. Uh, when, I, when I left the council uh, last year, uh, I think it was approaching uh, 150 million. Uh, dollars. Um, so we are responsible for policy matters. Uh, we do, um, we are organized in the three standing committees, uh, AP and E, academic progress and eligibility, anything concerning what makes a student athlete eligible, uh, what a student athlete needs to do in order to graduate, we have some responsibility for that. We monitor that, monitor that. we see grade reports, uh, we see advising reports, we're meeting with um, advisors, anything having to do with the academic program. Um, the second standing committee is, uh, uh, the acronym is ESAW, which stands for uh, Equity for Student Athlete Well-Being. Uh, anything having to do with equity issues, including Title IX. Uh, Title IX is huge. I mean, as uh, compliance is a major, major thing on our campus uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, that department probably has grown uh, the fastest in the last four or five years than any other area. Um, we do everything I could tell you because I chaired uh, that committee uh, differences in the showers uh, for men's teams and women's teams and how well the toilets flush. I mean, uh, it is truly amazing the kind of data uh, which has to be gathered that goes into making these Title IX reports. Uh, and this is really very, very serious matters and it covers a rather wide, wide range. We also do drug testing. We monitor anything that's health related uh, anything having to do with the medical, uh, the psychological, the social uh, well-being uh, of the student falls under uh, that committee. And the other one, of course, is finance and facilities. Uh, being a very, very large um, campus, uh, our football uh, uh, games routinely draw uh, 107, 108,000 uh, on Saturday afternoon. It's a huge, huge responsibility. We have a wonderful um, facility. Somebody has to manage that. All these things cost money. Um, um, the student athlete is our primary concern, and we have to watch that. Uh, one of the things being on Athletic Council that I realized is that there's a misperception 
about athletics on campus, uh, often on the part of other faculty and staff members. First of all, they think that the athletic department is rich. And when you compare it to the typical academic department, it really is if you're just looking at how much dollars get generated every, every weekend or every time we play a ball game. But of course, the chairman of the English department doesn't get a $5 million salary either. So all of those things kind of get spread out. Equipment costs, facility maintenance uh, go on and on, and we have to really monitor those things. So basically, in short, um, the Athletic Council is largely responsible for not only supervising and monitoring um, all policy matters within the Department of Athletics, but we also have an awesome responsibility in making certain that the rest of the campus understands uh, what the Athletic Department is all about. And I'll just stop right there. Thank, thank you much, you. Dr. McDaniel. Dr. Clement. Thank you. I'd like to thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, first thing I'll say is I, I'm, an, I'm an accounting professor here at UT, and I, I really enjoy being a professor. Uh, we say that our core purpose here at the University of Texas is to transform lives for the benefit of society. And I, I really do, sounds kind of corny, but I, I really do want my life to be about that. And I really think that the athletics department has a lot more potential for transformation than, than some other parts of the university. When you think about students, people who come here as student athletes, um, we probably have a higher percentage of first generation college students here. Um, my son played college sports and he was a great student, uh, but he probably wouldn't have gotten into his school if he wasn't a good basketball player. So he had access to an education that he may not have had access to otherwise. And so um, I, I really value my, my opportunity to participate in things that happen in the athletics department. My role here, uh, we call people who do what I do the faculty athletics rep. Uh, when President Powers appointed me to the position, uh, they gave me a document that was about six pages long, maybe seven pages long, telling me what my, my responsibilities were. And uh, I, I kind of had to remind them I already have a full-time job, you know, so <laughs> doing six pages worth of extra stuff was, was quite a bit. And so we sat down and talked about it, and we tried to figure out what were the most important things about the job. and. Um, we kind of boiled it down to two things. One is uh, we want to make sure that we're maintaining some type of institutional control. So in other words, the athletics department's not acting like it's just a commercial enterprise separate from a university. You know, we're part of an academic institution. And so part of my job is to kind of monitor things and make sure that I feel somewhat comfortable and advise him if I think things aren't going fairly well that way. The other thing that, that we do, which is really important to me, is um, we monitor student athlete well-being. And just like uh, Teddy said, we have uh, an athletics council here, and I see some of my colleagues here who've been on the athletics council, and we do a lot of the same things. And I think the athletics council actually tries to do a lot of these same things. We, we, we try to make sure that we're maintaining some type of institutional control, and we try to make sure that the student athletes are treated well, and we kind of monitor student athlete well-being. My, uh, my, my real goal as a faculty athletic rep, one of my big goals is to try to make sure that the student athletes um, appreciate the opportunities they have here to get an education. And if I could have one wish for our student athletes, it would be that that education would become a family value for them if it's not already. Okay, and I, when I sit down with them, I, I, I try to encourage them and say, you know, you're not really here just for you, you're here for future generations of your family. Uh, I think to my family, I feel very blessed, I feel very fortunate. My, my grandmother actually had some college, my dad was a professor also. And so when I was growing up, it really wasn't much of a question about whether or I was going to go to college or which one I would go to. And a lot of that had to do with decisions that my grandmother made. And I, and I sit down with these student athletes and I tell them, you know, you could be the same person in your family that my grandmother was in mine. Your grandchildren could be sitting up in college, you know, and not even thinking about why they're there, but it could be because of some, some decisions that you made while you're here as a student athlete. And so, you know, anything I can do to kind of help them understand the value of education and what they can do with it is, is kind of what I try to do. So one, one of the things I do is um, we have speakers that come to the business school and talk about business and leadership and all, that, all, the, all those types of things. And so when I have a chance, I try to bring them over to talk to our basketball players or our football players. And I, and I especially try to um, bring people who might have backgrounds like some of theirs. So if I can find somebody who was raised on the South, in fact, there's a person I know, some of you in the room may know him also, who was a uh, 
raised on the south side of Chicago by his mom, and now he's one of the owners of the Houston Astros, right? And so to bring somebody like that over to them and say, look, you know, here's some of the things you could do. Here's some things you should think about. Don't think about just playing for a sports franchise. Think about owning one. Here's somebody who came from a background like yours who's doing that. To me, I mean, those are the kind of things that, that I try to do. My grandfather uh, gave me some advice, and, and this really drives a lot of what I try to do. He said that everybody gets at least one big opportunity in life, but most people don't recognize it when it comes along. And I think my job is to try to help these student athletes rep recognize what kind of opportunity they have uh, from being here. And with that, I'm going to pass along to, uh, to Leonard here. I'm a, I'm a big fan of his. I'm going to see what he has to tell us today. <laughs> uh, good evening. So for the past 17 years, um, this work with student athletes has motivated me. Um, I spent nine years as a professor at LSU in one of the most bizarre environments I've ever been in, but it was very uh, productive. Me, Dr. Harrison, and Dr. Vincent were there at the same time. And the thing that motivated me to get tenure and to get tenure early was I wanted to make sure that I could interact with these young men and women for the duration of my career. And early on at LSU, I was working with a lot of black students, and a white professor came up to me, and he said, quote, Leonard, you can do this Martin Luther King act if you want to, but if you don't publish, we'll run you out of here. That was all the motivation I needed, because although he may not have said it in the most diplomatic way, he was right. That at the end of the day, what mattered on the Vita was if I published or not. And so I was able to get tenure, being in my fourth year. And I think at LSU and at here, I, you know, I really just try to be an advocate for the student athlete. Um, I really have a lot of passion and really a lot of, um, in many ways, my heart, I really, try to work alongside academic support directors because oftentimes they are put in tough situations. They don't determine who is recruited. If the kid is recruited from a tough background, not prepared academically, they are expected to get the young man or the young woman up to speed. If the kid comes to campus and don't do well, and there's eligibility concerns, the academic staff is typically blamed for it. So what I've tried to do over the past 17 years is be an advocate for the student. And as a professor, I believe it is our job to confront coaches. That's right. I mean, I didn't grow up in a culture where we put football coaches on pedestals. I, didn't, I don't know where that came from. And I remember when Nick Saban got hired at LSU, me and Dr. Harrison was in his office two days later, you know, having a come to Jesus meeting, letting him know what our expectations were. And similarly, when Coach Strong came, me and Dr. Harrison had that same meeting, introducing ourselves trying to find out what the value system was. So it has been, um, it has been a good ride. I am hard on athletic departments, uh, but I'm a team player. And I'll just show you one way how, how fa faculty members need to be advocates. I was teaching a class one semester, and many of the young men on the basketball team were in the class. And they had a game on a Thursday night out of town, and my class was Tuesday around noon, and the kid said, well, Dr. Moore, we gotta leave class early to go get on the bus for the game. I said, hell, y'all taking the bus to New York City? <laughs> and he said, no, nah, but they told us we got to leave class. I said, no, that's not going to happen. So we went in the hallway, and I called the coach. Now, in the coach's defense, I don't believe the coach was being malicious. I don't believe the coach had foul intent. Coaches are caught up in their own little world. One of my good friends is the top assistant at Wichita State. He was a top assistant at Arkansas. And whenever I go hang out with him all day, you wouldn't even know he's at a university. You would think he is in the office of an NBA franchise. And so what I've come to realize is that coaches, under a tremendous, coaches are under a tremendous amount of pressure to win and produce. And I had to grow and to respect them as professionals. But what I found in dealing with head coaches, coaches, how can this be a win-win for both of us? I know you want to win, but understand, coach, we need some time with these young men and women so you can win long term. And so I tell coaches, it's not about playing checkers anymore, it's playing chess. Coach, how can we set you up for long-term success? And so for some coaches, that means giving up a little bit of control. And I say, coach, they call me a radical. I live in the suburbs. I'm married. I got three kids. We got a dog. My kids play the piano. <laughs> <laughs> so I ain't that radical. Right? <laughs> but they are not used to being challenged. And I really think if you really want to help a coach out, challenge them. And I think we begin to, we'll begin to see some results when faculty members, again, start using the power of their position, going to practice, going to the weight room, just walking in a coach's office, and just sitting down. And I think what we'll begin to see, we'll begin to, 
give coach a different perspective. Because it's my experience, they all want to do the right thing. But a lot of them have been socialized into this profession where in many ways it's, you know, they expect student athletes to eat, drink, and sleep uh, their sport. Thank you. Hi, I'm in my uh, seventh year on the athletic board at the University of Wisconsin. And I'll, I'll try to just focus on some comments that um, you haven't heard because a lot of what you've heard is absolutely true across the board. At Wisconsin, we have a, uh, a pretty large uh, athletic board. We have over 20 people. And it's structured around a shared governance process where it's constituted by the shared governance entity. So the faculty senate selects the faculty. The academic does the academic staff. And then we have a classified staff option, which is just recently added. And then the student government association selects the student representatives. And then our alumni association uh, has slots as well. Um, and so we, we have a process there that's the how, how it gets constituted. The, the one uh, item that w we have, uh, which I haven't heard, but you all might have it as well, is we actually do have oversight as a part of our uh, uh, description. And it's not just for academic matters. It's actually oversight of the athletic department. Um, and so while uh, we may not make certain major decisions, we do have to ratify them um, in certain ways for them to become official. Um, and it creates a pretty challenging situation. Um, the committee that I uh, chair is called the Personnel Committee. And we deal with um, all the hiring, contract renewals, and evaluations. And what that means is, um, we have uh, sport liaisons, uh, usually faculty sport liaisons. And uh, each sport has a faculty member whose uh, responsibility um, is to attend uh, practices, to, to engage, to understand how uh, coach and player interaction looks both on the field and off the field. Uh, they're highly encouraged to travel with the team. Uh, to see what that looks like as well. Um, and then all of the sport uh, reps, uh, we play a role in the uh, evaluation. We have to write a section that goes in the coach's evaluation process. I'm uh, the football is my sport. So that means I spend time uh, going to practice trying to engage uh, what, what that process looks like, travel with the team, meet uh, on a number of occasions with the head football coach so that uh, he is able to uh, understand uh, any concerns we may have, but also to capture what concerns may be on his plate as well. And uh, you know, it's a, it's a, a pretty challenging uh, scenario. Uh, in that regard, I've also been uh, a part of two uh, searches. We've. Uh, Y'all can't keep a football coach. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 I won't. Well, I only can say so much. But, but I will say that what that process means is that we have a role uh, in that process. We're not. We're not deciding if they can call the right plays. Uh, but, but we do. Uh, and are vested with ensuring that they understand the values and expectations of the institution. And so as a part of the interviewing process, and it's a very small uh, group that gets to do that, um, uh, my role and responsibility is mm -hmm. to clearly communicate to the candidates what the expectations are, the academic expectations of the institution. You may be able to coach, but can you coach here? And and be very clear about the kind of student athlete, uh, the admissions and, and different uh, dynamics. The other component is we have to be pretty clear with them about this arrangement. Our uh, oversight process is pretty unusual and many coaches don't have to deal with this where they're coming from. And so if they don't understand that it's real and it's not uh, just um, on paper, 
then it becomes quite challenging uh, for them to deal with. So, um, so in, in, in my context, I'd say the, the couple points I'd like to highlight is, you know, there are a lot of uh, critical matters that do cut across. Uh, in our particular case, we do have some tension around um, this oversight dynamic, what it means, mm -hmm. what it looks like in the hiring process. Um, and uh, in our most recent hire, you, the, the coach uh, did ask the question, how, how might I be a good participant in the process? And, and my comment was, understand and respect the benefits that come from it and not only focus on the challenges. Because there's great benefit to have champions across campus when you need it. And then it's also important for representatives to be able to communicate to the campus community um, what is going on. Um, you all probably know this very well, but every time we get a new crop of board members, there's always a healthy, uh, well, there may be some over skepticism. There's individuals that come in and it's a witch hunt. It just cannot be all good. Somebody's doing something wrong. Where is the pot of money? You know, that, that happens. And a lot of that has to do with not being fully informed. Uh, everything in the paper is not true. Even though it looks real, it's on ESPN, I can tell you being a part of some of the search, our searches, the ticker on it, that's not accurate. You know, it might be eventually, but it's not accurate. <laughs> so some of that stuff is not quite right. Uh, so it's been it's been a very rewarding process for me. I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of it. So thank thank you. So um, let, let me just attest to how much you have mellowed, Dr. Uh, Dr. Moore. Um, I think when I first met you, I think you had a Darshiki and an Afro. I think I think. Um, and as he came into my office and I said, who is this brother coming in my office talking about what am I going to do or not do? <laughs> but, but as you can see, uh, we, have been, we have been great, um, great, great partners. And Thais, I think it's Thais here. Th Thais, thank you. Um, uh, I want to uh, point to uh, Dr. Clement just for a moment. He mentioned he's very modest that his son um, played um, Division One basketball. His son played basketball at Princeton. And what was your experience? You you serve as faculty athletic rep. What was your experience as a parent of a Division One student athlete? It, it really wanted, it made me really want to serve the student athletes. Um, I mean, we had a couple experiences there that were really questionable. Um, as you might imagine blacks on Princeton's basketball team. And the, um, the coach who recruited my son left after my son's freshman year. So when the new coach came in and seen my son in practice one day, probably just about one day, he goes over to my son after practice and says, uh, I bet you're the best dancer on the team. And so you know, it just makes you realize that uh, there are all kinds of things that, that student athletes may have to deal with that we don't typically think about. Like we don't know what's happening in practice and we don't know and I have a pretty close relationship with my son and he would he would tell me things and you know I said one of the things I care about is student athlete well being is because you know I kinda got to see firsthand that there are a lot of things that these student athletes have to deal with that, that we may not think about all the time. Yeah. It's a lot of stuff. So. Thank you. One of the interesting things that that is going on is that we look at this uh, this notion of, of big time college athletics like it's a new phenomenon. Now there's some new developments of it, but just to give a little um, context, the Ivy League was actually created as an athletic conference, not a academic conference. And if you look at the stadiums, you can see that at the time when they were established, these stadiums of 50,000, 60,000 are comparable to these mega stadiums that we had now. And if you look at the news reports, even from the turn of, this, of the last century, you would think that the, the issues we're facing today 
were the same as they, they were back in the early 1900s. In fact, the University of Chicago, which is one of the reasons why they de-emphasize athletics, um, used to bring in ringers for Saturdays to play in their athletic contest, which is one of the reasons why they dominated college athletics in the uh, early early years. And so uh, Coach Stagg, who is, who is venerated, uh, certainly had some questionable um, recruiting practices, so uh, for, for sure. Um, there are a couple of obviously high profile issues that are facing athletic departments and universities, so let's delve into this uh, a bit. Um, the, the first one is pay for student athletes. Um, so as, as, as representatives of the, the governance structure, what are your thoughts um, as, as, as leaders on your campus about pay for student athletes? And, and you can take it in any order. One of our uh, responsibilities deals with the budget as well as I'm sure uh, otherwise. And so as you begin to look at the budget, a lot of the attention is focused on how much money comes in. And no one pay, thinks about how much goes out. So it is true that athletics does generate a lot of money, but it has to spend in a lot of cases more than it generates. Um, and so when you start to break down the additional cost necessary to do it, it becomes much more difficult than the, the, the position in general. Um, and so um, I, I do think that um, over time there will have to be some type of model to ensure that more benefits makes it down to the student athletes in, in meaningful ways. But the question then becomes, what happens to the athletic departments that can't come up with additional resources to do it? Because the overwhelming majority of the athletic departments could not function without a university subsidy or a tax-based type of subsidy. Thank you. Uh, Dr. McDaniel. It's a huge problem. Um, and much of it is driven, quite frankly, by the fact that they pay coaches incredible sums of money. And some of the best minds intellectually uh, on any campus, all you have to do is look at your best teachers. And when you compare all the years of study, all the years of publishing and research, and you see what they earn, and you look at this championship football team, and my team is playing on Monday night right up the street. It's like night and day. So that's, that's an issue there. There is an incredible imbalance that the system uh, is having to deal with. Uh, and now what we see is assistant coaches particularly defensive coordinators on football teams, offensive coordinators and so on. A number of them are millionaires right now and it's just getting higher. The problem is that the train has already left the station. And we continue to define this student athlete uh, as an amateur. If you were to look at the facilities of any of these major universities, they have absolutely everything. There is nothing that they lack that will develop the athlete. They will find a way to pay for it. There are boosters, there are huge people in the community who love those colors, love to see that band come down the field playing all of these fight songs. These are their memories. They love the institution and they will pay for it. And that's what is happening. So you've got this incredible imbalance between the haves and the have nots. Now, what, how can we resolve this chord? It's gonna be interesting to see because we've been talking about this on my campus now for several years. And the problem always seems to eventually come down to revenue generating sports. And you know, 
the sports that make the money, of course, of football and men's basketball primarily. Some women's basketball teams do well. Most other sports depend on the revenue generated by the sports I just cited. That's a fact. And so the question then becomes, will the compensation be equal for the rifle team or the pistol team uh, or the lacrosse team. So that's the kind of tension that, that you have as you do attempt to balance the books. You see signs, however, that money is flowing into just yesterday, the day before yesterday. Look at what the NCAA did. Ohio State's athletic director, dear friend of mine, Gene Smith, had been fighting, particularly since the Alabama game, well actually he started, uh, my dear friend, Brother Jackson, when we <laughs> beat Wisconsin in the Big Ten Championship game. See, that's right, get that in. <laughs> see, see. <laughs> how, can, how can the parents afford, it's easy to drive the three hours over to Naptown from Columbus. It was harder to go to New Orleans. Now. Are they going to turn right around right. a few days later and be able to come to Dallas? You know what those ticket prices are? So these are the kinds of tensions. But what did the NCAA do? They kicked the $800 per uh, 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 parent up to $1,250, a max of $2,500 per family that they will reimburse. So there are signs. And one of the reasons I think that the five power conferences have moved. It's kind of like the state of Texas. They don't need the rest of the union, right? They can get on their own. <laughs> I won't say that. Strike that one. But that's what you have. Those five power conferences want to govern themselves because they have the money, you know, and they, they can afford it. Now, what will happen to the others? It's anybody's guess. Yeah. Mike, what are your? So uh, initially, I, I was pretty much against the idea of compensating student athletes. Uh, and then my son, who we just mentioned, and then he and I got into a lot of debates about it. He's kind of swayed my thinking somewhat. Um, but I think th there are a lot of complications, as Teddy pointed out, like trying to figure out, well, should the quarterback and linebacker get paid the same amount? I mean, when you really start to think about it, there are a lot of complications. But what I keep thinking is, if you go back 15 years and think about how much money there was in college sports, and then you think about how much money is there now, you think about how much other people in the game have gotten, how much the student athletes have gotten, how much they've received. I mean, it just seems like there's a little bit of impropriety there someplace. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I think this point is so well taken. You know, do you, you, I think you 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 hit it 15 years ago. If you looked at the compensation structure of most universities, typically the highest paid persons were medical uh, um, professor, faculty in the medical school, right? Um, and the you know big specialties. Then the college president, and then these athletic. Uh, uh, personnel, right? They were in the mix. And now that's just so skewed um, in, in some really important ways. When we hired uh, Nick at, at LSU, he made $490,000 at Michigan State, and we bumped him up to a million. And that was huge then, right? And now you have, you have position coaches making you know, close to that. Certainly your coordinators are making that kind of money. So that, I think that 15-year that mark, I think, is an important one. Let's switch to another thing. And, and Dr. Moore, you've talked about this a, a great deal. What, and, and, and some of you who have done, did a great job with your earlier presentations talked about the lack of access to the full range of majors for, our, for many of our student athletes. Um, wh how, as, as, as uh, members of the governance structure, can we ensure that students get to major in the, uh, get to concentrate in the majors that they uh, desire? I think it's strictly a structural issue. I'm looking at those student athletes from Iowa State. Give them a hand, y'all, folks from Ames, Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> I right there. All right. um, but to me, it's a structural issue. You know, um, and Brian Davis, former, you know, Associate AD for Academics Football will tell you that, you know, at most major institutions, you play football or basketball, you, you can't take a class after 
So in theory, a university may have a wide variety of majors, but you know, at some point, those major classes are going to be offered after 1.30. So the list of your available majors goes from this to this. And so my, now the athletic, that's, not, that's not an athletics issue. That's an academic affairs issue. And I think we shouldn't allow department chairs to deliberately schedule classes in the late afternoon because they don't want student athletes to take them. Because most academic departments fear that they will be stigmatized if they have a large number of black athletes in a specific class. So we need to take that up with deans and the provosts. That's not an athletics issue. That is strictly a structural issue that we have got to, that we have got to demand that gets changed. Let, let, let me stick on this issue. Um, one of the things that's dominated the news is some of these academic scandals, right? We had the academic scandal at Chapel Hill. We had the academic scandal that just came out that was featured in the Chronicle. As, as, as again, leaders in the governance structure, how do you all proactively address this issue of, of, of academic um, dishonesty? We, uh, we have a process um, where there's a review of clustering. Um, and so they, there's an active, uh, they actively explore that because of the you know, known scandals <coughs> and, and particular challenges there. Um, we, we also have a process uh, whereby uh, student travel is a review, you know, so if you're under a certain GPA, uh, you may not be approved for um, travel to away games, so you only could play at home and not away. Um, and so, so, so we, we have a, a structure where the department, the athletic department is looking at it, but then also those, those data are reviewed by our academic uh, compliance uh, committee as well. Thank you. Teddy, Micah, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I'll, I'll say that there's a lot of blame that can go around on that. Scandals generally are not just one-sided. Uh, there almost always needs to be a cooperating partner, some way, maybe subtle, maybe not quite as significant. Um, but what we have to do, and this is the reason why, I think the primary reason why athletic councils do work, because we do our very best to do the right thing. Now, as has already been said up here, uh, coaches get paid to win, okay? If they don't win, you know, it doesn't matter. They can talk about, you know, my starting guard uh, will be a Rhodes Scholar next year. He made Phi Beta Kappa. You know, the GPA of my team is such and such. I can tell you, fans don't give a hoot about that at that point. You know, that is so much, much pressure to win. And when the pressure is so great to win, it's easy to fudge in some ways. You know, uh, uh, students have to write papers. I mean, uh, if you are a liberally educated person, you gotta sh demonstrate you can think critically. Uh, and not just verbalize, but put things down on paper. You know, you have to be able to do that, or else why are we in school to begin with? Students who, are uh, inadequately prepared, have difficulty writing papers. So we have situations sometimes with tutors who uh, you can't put all the blame on them, but they're under some pressure to, to assist in every way that they can. So that's what I mean by there's enough blame to go around. I mean the system can only take so much, a lot of them being, and they're fortunate if they don't break. We hear about those that do break, and that's the situation, because there's such incredible pressure on everybody. Because, you know, if you get a nine and three record, Earl Bruce, a longtime coach at Ohio State, we used to call him old nine and three Earl. You know, he had to go. John Cooper followed him as head coach, beat 
uh, won at least 10 games almost every year, had the win in this record of any Big Ten coach during the years he was there, but he couldn't beat Michigan and he couldn't win the ball game. He had to go. Jim Trestle. Jim Trestle won seven out of 10 Big Ten championships. Okay, what did he do? He supported his quarterback on this right. gun tattoo stuff. It eventually caught up with him because when he testified before whatever body that was adjudicating the matter, you know, he said he didn't know about it when in fact he did. He didn't commit the criminal act himself, but he did tell the truth at the time. What happened? He had to go. The president of the university, I was, he was two people from me at the athletic council when he said some wonderfully kind remarks about, the, about Notre Dame and Catholics. <laughs> David, you read that meeting. We were getting ready to go to a bowl game. It was in December. <laughs> <laughs> the president, the president of the university. He was just talking. He thought he was talking amongst friends, I guess. It eventually caught up with him. Right. He had to go. And that's the reality of it. I mean, so whatever you say, just always think that somebody's got to record us, so be careful or whatever. I hope you're not taping this. <laughs> Well, I'm going to um, I'm going to pose one last question and open it up to uh, the uh, uh, our audience, and that really has to do the other issue that's really dominating, um, which is Title IX and the sexual assault issues. Uh, we heard that Jameis Winston, who was recently um, uh, cleared uh, on the, the uh, student judicial panel at Florida State. Oh, well, they, I should say that independent uh, investigator. But there have been a number of, of, of cases, including um, at, at, the, at the University of Oregon, and there are other cases as well. Um, as faculty athletic uh, uh, um, representatives on the council and part of the governance structure, what can you do uh, to help in, uh, address that? And can you talk about ways that your respective institutions have addressed this issue on campus? And again, I'll start with Dr. Clement. So we, I don't think we really think about those issues so much specifically um, on the athletics council, but the one thing that we've done I think it really good is we hired a coach who really cares about that, really public in terms of his stance on that. So I think, I think one of the best things we can do is make sure that leadership is conscious of those issues and really kind of makes everybody understand that they think those are important issues. I think that's probably the best thing that we can do. Yeah, absolutely. Abby, as a faculty member, I challenge this notion that it's a rite of passage for college kids to come and get drunk for four years. I just challenge that. And so one thing I do typically Friday, Saturday night, I may just text some ball players and say, make good decisions tonight. Um, I tell the brothers that as a black male student athlete, you got a small margin for error. Particularly in a place like Austin, small black community, when they walk on 6th Street, everybody knows who you are. You are under the spotlight. And it's just about making good decisions. So when you talk to brothers just about, you know, you only get one opportunity, and that's pretty much it. Sometimes it, it sinks in. Um, we had a situation that everybody in this room is probably familiar with. Uh, we fired the band director, uh, who didn't commit the crime, but uh, was fired because he didn't do enough to correct the problem. Here is the most talented uh, young band director. He had served as assistant for 10 years. Uh, I know him well. He's a former student. Uh, he and I playing the Michael Jackson show two years ago. They got viewed on YouTube, over 15 million uh, views on YouTube. And it's a most unfortunate situation. But I do agree with Urban Meyer on one thing that I have heard him say. And he has two daughters. He has one son, he has two daughters. It's just zero tolerance. You know, we can't slap women. We can't beat up women. We can't hit women. It, it's, it's just, that's it. And if we have to, you know, close the doors and get in a room by ourselves, and do more teaching and change the values of people in our own communities? Because the cases we hear about every day, it's frightening. I mean, hardly a week goes by that we don't hear about 
somebody slugging somebody upside the head. And, and it's an unfortunate situation, but that is the reality of it. And we've got to change that. We've got to change that. So we're going to have to value that. And it doesn't matter whether it's, most of the time it seems to be male to female. Sometimes it's the other way. Sometimes we've just got to stand up for what, what the right thing to do. I don't know how to solve that problem, but maybe more discussion about it. Uh, but we have to take a leadership role and be proactive about trying to deal with that issue. Yeah, I, I think that, that uh, Mike, you hit it on the head. I think hiring a good, strong coach um, that, that, that sets those values and both the academic things, I think that's really critical. So I appreciate that. Dr. Jackson. dealing with athletics and all the challenges that may go with whether you feel it should be or not be at an institution and you have to be in there in the room dealing with not only the reality that these professionals, these are their lives and their jobs, but you are representing a broader mission of the institution and sometimes the, the values and expectations are not the same. And so there are a lot of hurt feelings that we're not talking about right now. There's a lot of disagreement. There's a lot of things that don't always go well um, because it's very difficult. This is very difficult work. I, we're not, I get, we, we didn't really respond in that way, but this is challenging. Uh, I know for me, I had no clue how much time and effort was going to go into this work. And, and how much it matters to people you would have never just imagined. I mean, the, the emails from individuals because they were at an event and there was a Native American mascot. And, you know, we have the, the, the policy, at least in Wisconsin, in most places where you don't play. But the, 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 the person didn't re realize that the mascot had been changed but you cannot police the behavior of a fan that has a shirt that they want to, they bought and they want to continue to wear. You know, it's pretty difficult uh, uh, work. Um, and just being in the middle of uh, misperceptions, I mean, there, when the Big Ten Network came to be, there was some belief that our athletic director played a role in Madison not carrying it. So, I mean, just some of the things that you, you, you deal with is, is pretty uh, interesting. So it's, it's difficult work, but at the end of the day, it's worthwhile because, you know, we have some very talented uh, students that uh, we have to champion on behalf of. We have an institution that deserves to find ways to fully integrate and uh, uh, allow student athletes to be students. And that's at the end of the day, a lot of what our challenge is, we have an infrastructure that prevents student athletes to fully enjoy their student experience. Yeah, I, I, I think I'll, before I turn over, I just wanna make one comment about the, our, our four um, panelists. Um, they all are not only tenured, but full professors. And I think that is so important when we talk about this issue because, because of their stature, because of uh, the, the leadership they have at their own academic, and they all are leaders in their own academic departments, they have the ability, and what I appreciate about what all of you have been able to do is use your position, um, use your capital uh, to advocate for student athletes, and for that I, I greatly appreciate that. Um, let, let's open it up to, to questions, yes.
Yes, um, at Ohio State, in addition to the eight faculty, there are uh, seven other members, total 15, um, two undergraduate students um, and their governing systems um, ultimately uh, recommend uh, those, those two students. There's one graduate student and one professional student. So those uh, are the four voting, voting members uh, from the student ranks. We, we also have students on our, on our athletics council. Uh, we'll have current students and a lot of times uh, we'll have alumni members, uh, people appointed by regents or somebody like that. And a lot of times those, those um, members of the athletics council also were former student athletes. So we'll have some current students on the and they may or may not be student athletes, but they will be students. And uh, we also have some former student athletes on the on athletics council as well. Thank you. Yes. Greetings, gentlemen. Uh, Keith Adams, CK Saving Project. My uh, dissertation topic has a, to do with uh, finding the balance between academic and athletic success from the perspective of first and second year student athletes. And in my reading, I have read a lot about the potential adversarial relationship between the faculty and the uh, staff and the student athletes themselves. Can you speak from your expertise on whether, one, you see that relationship being adversarial, and two, any suggestions you have about that topic? I don't think it has to be adversarial. I think it should be a win-win for both. You know, I went to a coaches convention. Where's Leslie at? Uh, uh, AFCA, American Football Coach Association, the NFLPA had a session I spoke at, but thousands of coaches there and to hear their stories about how long it took them to get a head job. And I think it took Coach Strong 28, 27, 28 years. So one thing we have to do as faculty members is respect coaches as professionals, and we don't do that. I mean, a lot of them, and we see where Urban Meyer is now, but you know, you remember he went to Bowling Green, he went to Utah. I mean, we see the coach, Brian Kelly, in Notre Dame. He was at, I think, Grand Valley State or some small school in Michigan. So we've got to respect them as professionals and understand the interests can converge. I mean, they want to win. They want to keep people successful in the classroom, and they want to stop off-the-field issues. So to me, it's not an adversarial relationship. It's, Coach, how can we come to a common ground where we can help you be successful? All right, great. Thank you. It's yes. Oh, go, go ahead. It's adversarial sometimes on a lot of different fronts. One, for example, um, when it comes to building facilities, I know of departments on uh, my campus that have been fighting for years and years to get a new building, okay? They deserve it. They have some of the best professors, some of the best minds. The intellectual capital is well respected. Athletic departments, can raise money like that, it seems. And there is, even in the development office, that tension that goes on between identifying this potential donor who may give to athletics, but who may give to the English department, for example. I mean, these things are very, very real. Uh, I quite agree with Leonard, it does not have to be adversarial, but a lot of faculty don't take the time to try to analyze the situation with athletics. They just look over on my campus, they see this huge, uh, nearly 20,000 seat basketball arena that went up like that one day. They see a, a brand new track and field uh, uh, named after Jesse Owens, a graduate of Ohio State University that's second to none in terms of track and fields on campus. They look at our football stadium, the Horseshoe, uh, and they see all of the sort of very tangible evidence of progress and big dollars. And they raise, rightfully so, why not the School of Music? I serve in one of those departments that's been begging for years for a new building. And I'll retire before they get one. <laughs> but that's, that's some of the reasons why there's sort of that kind of innate uh, adversarial uh, situation that you, that you have on the campus. The athletics, you see it. And 
let's also put the blame, we haven't mentioned this today, but let's put the blame too on Sports Center and ESPN. I mean, they give these off the chain billion dollar TV contracts, they buy everybody up. Right. Mm -hmm. And and you got student athletes who look forward to Sports Center every time they want to see that slam dunk. I mean they want instant gratification, they want instant recognition and, and, and that's part of the culture that we're having to deal with as well. They don't do that for the English department poet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I'm Gerald Gurney. I'm the president of the Drake Group, a past president of the National Association of Academic Advisors for Athletics and a two-time alumnus from The Ohio State University and a one-time alumnus from Iowa State, so I have lots of friends here. Um, this is a governance question. Mark Emmert, our NCAA president, has been, to say the least, a, a polarizing individual, um, often getting widespread criticisms from large factions of faculty reps, the media, presidents that are not in the Power Five conference, a variety. So my question to you is, in that most athletic departments are operating in the, in the red, even among the Power Five conferences, 45 of the 65 are also in the red, can the NCAA reform itself? Simple question. <laughs> I, asked so, Dr. I, I asked Dr. Vincent to take it because uh, Mark Emmert was chancellor at LSU and he hired uh, Dr. Vincent back in 1999. Well, people really would like to see him go back to LSU. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you for that because I was going to do that full, I was going to do that full disclosure. Um, you're talking about my guy, but it's, it's all right. Um, no, I, let, me, let me just share a little bit about that because I do think, you know, LSU was an interesting example for several reasons. Uh, one, um, LSU was one of the first places to put their academic center for student athletes in academic affairs. And at that time, I served as vice provost for academic affairs and, and campus diversity. So that's why the academic center uh, reported to me and by virtue of that position was also on uh, the athletic council. Um, I think there is something broken. I think Dr. McDaniel was, was, was speaking to this revenue generation. One of the challenges that I see um, with that Oklahoma case that was in the mid-70s when it broke the revenue, you know, that just changed the dynamics in some very significant uh, ways. And so, no, I do not think the NCAA can reform itself. Um, I don't think that any one person can, can, can do it. I don't know what the answer is, but I do know that there is a real challenge, and that starts even before college. Uh, when you look at um, the AAU ranks, when you look at the shoe um, uh, vendors, when you look at a number of various uh, opportunities, it's just there, there are just too many opportunities to corrupt the system. What I would also say is, and I, as I mentioned earlier, that this is not a new phenomena. Um, and I do think that this is something that, that is one of the most critical issues. I actually think that the unit that's going to have to step in is our, legis our legislature. I actually think there's going to have to be some real consideration about whether we're truly running a not-for-profit enterprise. That is my, that's my opinion on that. Um, we, we have time for one more question in the back, and then we'll, uh, we'll end, uh, end there. tenured position where they cannot get fired. 
That's all. That's my comment. <laughs> so, so, so one, so one of the most interesting um, parts of the academy is the changing role of the faculty, right? It used to be that the faculty, right, were the principal advisors for students. Um, when I went to school in the dark ages, right, I didn't have a professional advisor, I had a faculty advisor, right? And so the, prof the professionalization of this, of, this, uh, of this role of advising and basically faculty uh, largely, except for at the graduate ranks, giving up advising of students really has created this new cadre of professionals. And so the challenge becomes how do you protect those individuals, particularly when you, when you are faced with some of the inherent conflicts that we've talked about. One of the reasons why these folks work and others who are on the Athletic Council, because they're all tenured, right? And so, that, you know, you can't fire, that you couldn't fire them if you wanted to, right? And so, you know, you can run around campus and, you know, and, and, and tell a coach, right, a $5 million coach, no, your kids aren't coming out of my class, right? That's just not gonna happen. And so I do think that that, that idea of Athletic Council, and I do think that has to happen, Happen. I, I also I do think this issue about the role of the academic support um, group I think becomes really important that they have some level of, of security and whether that's a rolling contract or multi-year contract I do think there's something you know that needs to happen but I do think the most precarious position is the head of the academic support program for student athletes I don't know if others have anything to add Okay. All right. Well, thank you all, um, you know, very much. Thank you for this distinguished panel, and we, we do appreciate that.